about that. Well, welcome everyone to tonight's event, Making the Case for Inclusion. Before we begin, on behalf of Ladies at UX Melbourne, I acknowledge um, the Boon Wurrung and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional custodians of the land upon which I live, create, and am dialing from today, and acknowledge they have strived to retain their identity and cultures through more than 200 years of dispossession and colonization. I pay respect to their elders, past and present, and I extend that, that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people we have with us today and who will be watching this recording later on. Tonight, we'll be looking into inclusive design and learn how to influence people on why they should invest in inclusive design. While the context we'll be speaking about is within the professional workforce, I want to call out another thought to keep in mind throughout tonight's event. Currently, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander narratives and participation within our design practices are scarce. So much of our design approach, and to an extent, our working attitudes in the tech industry is Eurocentric. So if you think of these attitudes like, ask for forgiveness, not, not permission, move fast, break things. Even design thinking as a framework puts the designer in the middle of everything they do rather than the community in which they work with. So we have a really great opportunity to provide more inclusive spaces and involve our current practices with designers from the indigenous community. Imagine how much more we could learn or remix what we know today with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures, such as their inquiry skills within yarning circles, narrative-driven storytelling, or their nonverbal hands-on techniques. So as we go through tonight, learning the benefits of inclusive design and how to get more people embracing it, I'll leave you with this thought. How might we work towards having more culturally inclusive design practices here in Australia? A little bit about who we are for anyone who's new tonight, uh, who's joining us for the first time. Ladies at UX is a global meetup that started in Manchester, UK in 2013, and the Melbourne chapter started in 2014. The current co-organizers are myself, Berlin, I've got Ever with me tonight, and Anshal, who's, un I don't think she's here with us tonight, um, unable to join us. Our purpose is to provide a platform for women identifying and non-binary folks uh, to speak, facilitate, and share their knowledge. Uh, we're committed to creating a safe and inclusive space for all folks in the UX community. We don't tolerate discrimination of any kind, and we ask that by attending our events, you will observe our code of conduct, which we will post in the chat. Some housekeeping and conduct. I mentioned it earlier, but um, please keep yourself on mute so that we can hear our speakers loud and clear. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the session will be recorded, and you're more than welcome to turn off your video if you're not comfortable. Um, please observe our code of conduct. Again, we will post this in the chat right after this. And for questions tonight, we will pop them over to Slido. Um, the code we're using tonight is 650607. Again, we will post this in the chat and remind everyone as we go throughout. So yeah, keep that in mind. And now speakers tonight, I have the pleasure of briefly introducing you to uh, both Benaz and Bronwyn. Benaz is a product design manager at Open Table. What a job. <laughs> there she leads and design a design team across San Francisco and Melbourne, where she empowers designers to build products that help restaurants thrive. Such an amazing foodie job. Bronwyn is a senior product designer at Zero, and I have the privilege to work with Bronwyn at Zero and know that she takes great pride in mentoring women designers and is very passionate about leveling the playing field through collaborative and progressive thinking. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Bronwyn and Benaz. Thank you. I'm going to take over control of the screen. So cool. hopefully you can all see that. Yes. Perfect. All right. Thank you, Berlin. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining on the call. It's great to see everyone here. And I see a few familiar faces, which is great. And uh, you know, I, all the people that are joining in from Australia, I just hope you're keeping safe and well during this unique time. But today, Bron and I are gonna be talking about inclusive design and more specifically, as Berlin said, we're gonna be focusing on making the case for it within your company. Because as designers and managers, 
Bron and I both know how important it is to design inclusively, but we also know how hard it is to convince your teams or leaderships to invest in the practice. So we're excited today to share our experiences and our learnings and help you influence your company to invest in inclusion, inclusive design. But before we get into it, we're just going to keep high level. Berlin's done a great job in introducing us. But so as Berlin said, I'm Benaz. I'm currently a product design manager at OpenTable. We have a global design team across America, Australia and London. And I'm running a few initiatives. And one of the initiatives I'm running right now is inclusive, inclusion, inclusion, inclusive, that's the whole topic, um, design. And as well as Bronwyn, I mentor designers on ADP list. Yep. And also, as um, Berlin mentioned, I'm a senior product designer at Xero. I specifically work on the design systems team um, and has a strong focus on accessibility within the organization. Uh, as mentioned, a design advocate and speaker for digital um, inclusion and accessibility and an ADP list mentor and women in, women in innovation mentor as well. That's a hard one. So <laughs> today's topic, making the case for inclusive design. I'm assuming that the fact that most of you are here, you've either been bribed by Banaz and myself or that you're actually super interested in inclusive design. I'm hoping the latter. You may have just began on your journey. You may be somewhere down the line, but at whatever point you are, you're going to have to convince your organization to implement inclusive design at some point. And so hopefully today we can help with that conversation. So before we get started on the kind of how and the why, it's really important for us to all have the same definition of inclusive design to be able to have this conversation. I'm not saying this is the only definition, but it's our definition for today. So the British Standards Institute says that um, the design of mainstream products and or services that are accessible to and usable by as many people as reasonably possible without the need for special adaptation or specialized design. I'm going to touch on that last line a little bit more later, but that's their definition of inclusive design. So it's an easy assumption to think that people experience the same world that we do. You know, we sit, we stay within our similar friendship circles, speak to similar people, and we also kind of design personas with similar traits in mind. But we need to remember like 18% of Australians experience some type of disability, which is one in six people. And on a wider level, 20% of the global population are neurodiverse. So inclusive design focuses on the diversity of the people and the impact that this has on designs and products. It just ensures that places and experiences are open to all people regardless of their age, ability, language, culture, and background. So what do I mean by inclusion? People by their very nature are diverse. We are always changing, our needs are always changing. So ultimately inclusive design is not about designing one product or one solution for all. If we look at the pyramid on the right hand side, hopefully it's the right hand side for you, um, around 70% of the population experience anything from a minimal difficulty to a severe difficulty. And that's going to fluctuate and change as basically temporary and situational difficulties also come into play. So it's just simply not possible to design one solution for everybody. So what inclusive design asks us to do is think about developing multiple products or solutions that provide the best coverage for all users. And ultimately, what we want to do is reduce the level of ability required to use each product. So we've kind of just got aligned on what we mean by inclusive design, but I think just to get everybody warmed up, I'm going to spend 10 minutes running a little activity with you all. So this will just be, you can do this self-directed by yourself. We won't be doing any breakout rooms, 
But I first want you to kind of think of a digital product. If you're a designer in the room, it could be something that you're working on or a product that you use on a regular basis. Um, I'm currently kind of getting into Strava right now in lockdown, trying to run. But anyway, think of a product. All right, let's go to the next step. So the next step, we're gonna be assessing that product on how well it's accessing and being inclusive to all types of people. So we're gonna be testing this product against the universal score. This is a framework to evaluate inclusion and belonging. And I think, think this test is amazing just to get us all thinking about different aspects, whether it's belonging, well-being, physical needs, and neurodiversity. So the link is at the bottom, uh, bottom left-hand corner, but I'm gonna also put it in the chat. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna give us five minutes. I'm also gonna put some like fun, relaxing spa music on and go ahead and just take your time going through this test with that product in mind. Um, and yeah, I'll be back in five minutes. If you have any questions, please raise it in the chat and I'll be keeping my eye out there. So I'll put the timer on. See you all soon.
Okay. How is everyone going? I'm going to start bringing people back. If you haven't finished, that's okay. You can bleed into the next activity and just finish up. But now I want you to kind of reflect on what you've just done. Um, there were some awesome questions that were in there. And I want you, if you've got a phone in front of you, a notes app, pen and paper, anything that's with you, just do some self-reflection. Did you expect the score that you just got? And what did you learn by taking the test? So I'm going to give a, like three minutes, but if you haven't finished the test, feel free to finish it and then answer those questions as well. So can you keep them up on the screen? I'm going to play the music. Okay, now, now's the fun part. So I hope everyone, well, you know, answering the questions and thinking about how that was for you personally. But now let's start going into ideation phase. So let's think of ways that we can increase that product's inclusivity. So on the end of where your score is on that website, there's going to be some ideas. So you can use that as inspiration. But I'm going to give another like few minutes again to write down some of your ideas and how you can make that product more inclusive for all. So this will be the last task.
Okay, that song finished perfectly on time, which was not planned. So I'm going to start bringing everyone back. You can finish up your last thoughts. And definitely, yeah, we can definitely leverage the chat. If you've got some really great ideas, please share them. But um, thank you all for doing that warm up exercise with us. I think that was just a great way for us to be thinking about many different aspects of inclusive, inclusive design. So now you've got some ideas to de design inclusively. That's great, awesome. But now what? What are you gonna be doing with this knowledge? Say you work with the product managers and engineering, how are you gonna be convincing them that this is something that we should do if this was your product? And how many of you right now that are here are driving inclusively, inclusivity in your organization? If so, these phrases um, on the next slide may be familiar to you. And if, and if you're wanting to drive inclusivity, just be ready to hear some of these phrases and be prepared to kind of approach this. So some things that we can start to hear is inclusive design takes time or inclusive design doesn't benefit everyone. Or lastly, inclusive design doesn't provide much ROI. So what we'll be focusing on today, approving these points wrong. It's important to note that investing in inclusive design, it requires like a cultural and behavioral shifts. So we hope by the end of this talk, you walk away with confidence that you can start pushing it within your organization. So we'll be first covering why, why you should be caring about inclusive design. So that's all about making the case. Next is how, how are you gonna be sharing that knowledge with your team? So it's a bit more about like the soft skills and the leadership skills. And lastly, say you've started to get investment with your teams. Now you need to prove its worth, show its success and make sure it's measurable. Awesome. Thanks, Bernays. Um, I super enjoyed the warm up. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed the music. Um, I enjoyed the music. I enjoyed that chilling out to the music. I hope you did too. Nice way to do a Wednesday evening. Um, but let's start with step one, understanding the why. We're not going to be able to convince anyone that inclusive design is worthwhile if we aren't able to explain why it's beneficial and especially why it's important to people in the leadership or high up in the organization. So let's get into it. Why? First reason, inclusive design benefits everyone. Ultimately, inclusive design creates what we call the curve cup effect, so beautifully demonstrated by our image on the right. But ultimately, if we design something inclusively or accessibly, we're actually most of the time going to be able to include all users. So let's talk through the curve cup effect as an example. As you can see on the image here, the curb has an indentation. This was originally designed to benefit wheelchair users so that they could get up across the road. But actually, we're also benefiting parents with prams or strollers. We're benefiting children who, young children who might struggle to step up onto the step. The elderly who might struggle to step up onto the step. Uh, temporary disability, what if you have crutches? Maybe that's hard. I'm also going to say situational here, and I know we've all done it, but as we look down at our phone, as we're crossing the road and not looking where we're going, we can trip up on a curb. If we don't have that curb in the way, we'll be fine. So it benefits everyone. There's other examples of this, email. So Ray Charles is the in uh, inventor of email, and he originally invented it as a way to communicate with his deaf wife. Ultimately, when they were far apart, he couldn't pick up the phone and just talk to her. So he wanted to find a way to instantly have a conversation with her. He created email. Ultimately, whether you like email or hate email now, it has benefited everyone. But as I know you have a favorite. Yeah, I found during the pandemic that I was reading an article about clear masks. So right now we're all wearing masks, obviously. But what about the hearing impaired? If we could have some sort of clear masks, we can show more emotion. So I thought that one was a really interesting one. Yeah, awesome. I love this quote from Angela Glover Blackwell. When the walls of inclusion come tumbling down, everyone benefits. It's really lovely, nice and simple. Next, inclusive design sparks innovation. 
ultimately, if we're considering the needs of more users and more diverse users, we're actually having to think about how we can come up with more solutions to meet those needs. We're having to push outside the box um, and ultimately, hopefully coming up with more innovative solutions. We're going to have to ask questions around areas that we've never really had to consider before and hopefully push boundaries and make sure that no user gets left behind. Benjamin Evans is from Airbnb and he is the head of inclusive design there. And he has a wonderful quote on this as well, which is diversity and inclusion have always been the core of innovation. If innovation is about taking two ideas that are different and overlaying them, the more you do that, the more opportunities there are for innovation and the more creativity there is. This one always satisfies the bosses and the managers. <laughs> Inclusive design saves time and money. A lot of the time, inclusive design or even accessibility gets kind of added on right at the end of a project or a process. Uh, it's really kind of seen a lot of the times as a sort of let's tick the box and say we've done it and move on. But the minute we actually start to delve in it, we realize that we've actually got a lot of undiscovered needs and we're not meeting a lot of our user requirements. And so we have to go back to the drawing board uh, and then start again or rebuild potentially, making sure that we're actually going to meet the needs of those users. So ultimately, I encourage you that to say if we are implementing inclusive design practices from the beginning, then we are ensuring we're meeting the needs of all users, preventing the need to do any rework. This is a quote slightly on the flip side, which is about how you can make a slightly more money, but inclusive design can drive your profits up by nearly 50%. When educating your team about inclusivity and accessibility, you're not only giving them the skills to raise productivity, you're optimizing their workflow for the long run and fostering a healthy team culture. So as we've said, it's already good for business, but it's also great for people. By actually making sure that we understand and address the needs of our users, we actually mean that we're meeting more or creating more satisfied users. One of the best ways to get more business is actually through word of mouth. So we have satisfied users, they're going to spread the message. On the flip side, if we're choosing not to think about inclusion, we're actually consciously making a choice to choose exclusion. And again, that's going to be picked up by your audience or your users. And obviously, as we've already said, word of mouth. So that will spread and you may miss or lose users or um, opportunity of a reduced market. So ultimately, including more diverse users means that you can lead to a broader market appeal and address more markets, which in the long run goes back to that first point or that earlier point, you're going to make more money. Example here, 5 million Australians are unable to access products and services because of poor design. Yet, if they possess over, yet they possess over 40 billion in annual disposable income. That's quite a share. So this is my last one on this one. And ultimately, inclusive design is not, not illegal. Um, while inclusive design ultimately isn't illegal, um, but sorry, isn't a legal requirement, accessibility is. When designs are not accessible, a lot of companies actually uh, put themselves at risk of being uh, targeted for lawsuits. But accessibility actually is an outcome of inclusive design done well. So let's lean on like that. Let's use that to our advantage and use accessibility and the legalities of accessibility as a way to drive inclusive design. So I say again, be careful in quoting that inclusive design is illegal. It's not the case, but accessibility can be, and it can be a great tool for our tool belt. All right, thanks, Bron. So, now we can kind of understand and explain why inclusive design is important. There's so many different ways it is, but how are you going to be working with your team to kind of spread that voice? So what I'll be covering today are those cultural and behavioral actions you can do 
to raise your voice, but then you'll be able to amplify the voice of others as well. So I'm going to start by saying we shouldn't wait for our leadership or our management or our other designers to see that inclusive design is an asset. So the great designers that I've worked with, you know, they see gaps and then they show initiative to drive change. And what I need to remember is, and we all need to remember is leadership is not, or they shouldn't be not making decisions in a vacuum. You know, there's always someone there that's guiding them in the right decision. So you can be that person to help amplify the voice of others, raise those questions and um, push yourself in the, that direction. So I'm just gonna say it is hard. It does, it requires a lot of preparation, patience, but also discomfort. So I think we need to be comfortable in pushing ourselves in saying a few of these examples. So these are some things that I've said and Bronwyn have said at work. And it's something that we can start saying. One example is this way isn't working, but I can help us move in another way that will. Or specifically to inclusive design, we can say, I see an opportunity to expand our market and I'm willing to help us get there. My personal favorite, which is the bottom one, it's a super simple phrase. We can use it in a lot of things, but I would like to support and we're suitable lead with this initiative. So that also shows you managing up um, as well. The other thing when we're driving for change is trust is foundational. So I've worked with many different teams and different personalities. And the main thing I always go in when I'm working with new people is, how can I build super strong relationships so they trust me when I'm making decisions, I can take them along on my journey, and they can also help me when I'm trying to ask for a favor. You know, because ultimately, I think we all know this, we probably have some great teams that we work with, but the best teams that we've, I've worked with are the ones that are open to collaboration, which then boosts productivity and innovation. So... The ways that I can build trust within your team is start by explaining your thought process or your intentions or your reasons. So that's really part one, what Bronwyn just covered. That's, you can take that with you and that'll explain why you wanna do inclusive design. But say you're getting pushback with your PM or your engineers, you need to make sure that they feel heard. There's no need for you to just come straight in and say, this is the right thing to do. It's definitely tough for us to hear of why someone would not want to invest in inclusive design but still it's all about listening. Onto the point of inclusive design, we need to make sure we're including others. So you're gonna get that diverse set of opinions, but also build a team that really trusts your opinion. Also, while we're living in a remote world right now, it's even more important to over-communicate. So before a meeting, after a meeting, iterating why you're doing this is so important. And lastly, we just need to remember we're all people at the end of the day, we're all running on different levels of emotions. So don't be afraid to ask for help and be honest. These are all ways that I've practiced to build really strong teams. And I wanna drill down on one part of trust that I find really important and that's understanding stakeholder intentions and needs. So as designers, you know, we're constantly thinking about our users, motivations and needs, but what about our stakeholders? So I know, for example, my product manager would be interested in investing in inclusive design for different reasons than my engineer. So perhaps we can use a part of the design process that we're comfortable with and apply it to our stakeholders to understand their needs and intentions. For example, why don't we try running an empathy maps for each one of our team members? So that's the screenshot that's on the left. You know, I've done actually something similar. So when I was starting a new team and starting off a new project and I didn't really know how everyone was working, we all filled out user manuals, which is very similar to an empathy map. And that covered people's working styles. It covered their needs, their motivations, how well they would work. And we all did that together in a workshop. And then I used that as a foundation of how I would communicate to each one of those team members. And everyone's different, you know? So I was tailoring my communication to each person. So that goes back to then how can we speak their language once we understand our team members' intentions? We can obviously tailor our language verbally in meetings, but what about also in our 
design documentation. So you can see the screenshot on the right, that is a annotation in Figma from one of my design team members to shout out to Grayson. She's in America, so she'll see this later. She, um, in her Figma file, was writing her annotations about a feature that was increasing inclusivity for restaurants. But she also, she knew that her PMs and her engineers were gonna be looking at her file. So she documented why it's important and what we're hoping to solve for by having this feature. So I thought that was a great example. So let's say we're trying to tailor our language for each of our stakeholders. So I know for product management or for leadership, you know, their intentions can be around, let's think product success, um, market share, and also monetary value as well. So we could say something to our product managers like, if we cover more use cases now, the more we can expand our market reach. For example, for an engineer, I'm thinking they're more into product quality and the time is super important. So I might say something like, if we make this component more accessible, we'll increase usage and save time later. And what if you're in just encouraging your designers to really care about inclusivity? I think as a designer ourselves, we're kind of thinking about, we want the best user experience. So we could say something like, if we ensure our designs are inclusive from the start, we're creating a better and innovative experience for our users. All right, so for any of you that are on the call that are driving inclusive design by yourself or within a small group, first of all, good on you. It is definitely not a small task, but I hope you don't feel alone. You know, when I'm working on initiatives, I try to remind myself that there are people out there that care, but maybe they just don't know how to speak up or they're waiting for that champion. So you really need to find allies that can help you raise that voice. But one thing to note is try to push yourself to find allies outside of your peers, outside of your design organization. I know it's pretty safe to like start within your design org, but I think that's important for two reasons. One, I think we all know that design decisions aren't just made by designers. And two, it'll just bring a diverse set of opinions if you can bring different people into your team or into your troops. So example, you can bring someone from your support or someone from sales. That again, just like amplifies why uh, you're believing in a diverse set of opinions and diversity. And lastly, also just try and find allies above your level as well, because the people above you, they do have that lighter voice at the end of the day. Well, they don't really, but you know, hierarchically speaking, but those people above you can really champion that change as well. And once you've found, you know, a good set of allies that can help move with you, one thing that's important is obviously spreading awareness, but the thing I wanna really focus on is spreading awareness regularly because we need to treat the practice of inclusion as a permanent addition in your company. So you can definitely run a workshop or run a presentation very similar to what we're doing today. But the point that's really important is it should not be one off because really our goal is that inclusion should just be embedded within your culture. You can start getting people speaking about it and it's not really a massive discussion at that point. It's just part of your culture. One thing I like to always do is start small and make it achievable. So some things that we can do just to start small is create a Slack channel or even smaller, let's create a Slack bot, which is like a reminder within Slack. And we can start small just by sharing resources. From there, how about we create a working group and then we can meet regularly. We can also use existing rituals like lunch and learns. I think what's super important, which I said before, is including people that you wouldn't work normally together. If you're in a meeting and there's two people that are on the call that have not met each other and you're doing introductions, that's a win. That's a great thing. That means that you're bringing that diverse set of opinions in. And lastly, I just wanna remind you all to be patient. It's okay if you don't get any bites to start with. But when your troop does appear, which they will, you'll be ready to greet them. Awesome. So Benaz has just taken us through the how. We've got the why, we've got the how, 
And unfortunately, this is probably my least favorite part, which is proving its worth. And I say it's my least favorite part simply because a lot of the time we have to bring it back to monetary purposes or metrics and have to explain why. When actually it's just the right thing to do, including, including a diverse user base or being and practicing inclusive design is just the right thing to do. However, organizations and leadership don't always take that as the answer and they rely on organizational metrics or values. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk through on the last slide or the last section, some of those measurements that we can implement. So making it measurable. When we think about project specific, we can actually make it measurable by actually just trying to implement some goals or objectives into the actual project itself. We can do this by actually leveraging established guidelines that already exist out there. You've just done one, the universal score. Why not test beforehand and test after? You've then got yourself an area or something of a, a literal score and a metric. We've also got inclusivity and usability scores. There's accessibility usability scores, so you can start across kind of and do either or. And I know that WCAG at the moment is much more focused on accessibility, but we're actually about, or they're actually about to, if I say about, there's a little way off, but WCAG will be implementing 3.0, which is actually much more focused on the process um, and that process of testing with a diverse user base. And rather than being ranked on like a score, you're actually gonna get a bronze, silver and gold rating. And this is huge. Nothing's better than saying that you've got a gold star. Lastly, if you can get into organizational goals, OKRs are a really great place to implement huge um, or a huge uh, opportunity to implement a metric. The other reason it's awesome to get up at a organization level is that ultimately it will remain at the forefront of leadership. Projects sometimes get lost a little bit. OKRs don't. So some of you might be familiar with this, which is maturity models. You can definitely make use of these. If you're not familiar with maturity models, ultimately a maturity model defines how mature an organization is in addressing a problem um, and hopefully holds them accountable. Basically, you run through a set of criteria and you rank your organization against that criteria and give yourself a level. Then you decide as an organization what level you want to aim for. And then you can from there create yourself a set of clear and concise next steps. There is the one on the right, or both on the right, you've got the digital accessibility maturity model. And then there's also the UX maturity model. There is um, also an Envision one that just focuses on, I think, design maturity, but you can adapt and tweak these to make sure that they um, address inclusive design. One of the things I would say about the maturity models is you're not expected to rank yourself a one and then go, I'm gonna get a five. That's just unachievable and will probably scare a lot of people. If you're a one, aim for a two or a three. If you're a two, aim for a three or a four. Don't try and make it such a large jump that no one's really interested in doing those next steps. Also, last point on this is you don't have to get to a five at the end. As an organization, you might decide that actually sitting at three or a four is great. You might even decide, you know what, for the next two years, sitting at a two is great. As long as we're making improvements um, sort of granularly and going up. Next is validate and keep testing. So ultimately lean into the um, testing and uh, processes that we've got already inside UX and inside design. Make sure to recruit and collaborate with a diverse user base, get their opinions, get their thoughts, make sure you need to meet their requirements. Continue to use proven UX approaches like um, research and relevant um, Personas, uh, Vanaz talked about it earlier about using diverse personas if we can. Empathy mapping, we've already discussed, We've got to use them on our users um, and in initiative testing. 
we also say don't feel like you have to go it alone don't feel like it's all on your responsibility and it has to happen within the organization if you can get budget or a little bit and enlist some ha outside help you can bring the experts in and use it as a training opportunity as well as a opportunity to test your own um, accessibility evaluations or code reviews or again as we talked about before user testing lastly you can't design and meet the needs and validate the needs of your users unless your teams are diverse and they can help to validate those opinions so make sure to build diverse teams this is a whole thing in itself so i'm not going to go into this too heavy but it definitely applies if you're meet, wanting to meet the needs of diverse users you're gonna need a diverse team so once you've got those metrics and you've got some of those results, there's no point keeping them all hidden away and not showing the organization all the hard work that you've implemented. We've now got to shout about it from the rooftop. So set up regular paybacks with the organization or within teams to share the progress and the results. And who knows who you might inspire and bring along on the journey. Hopefully you'll build a whole new set of allies. Unfortunately, a lot of the time or some of the time management or organizational leads can't be in those meetings or in those rooms. And so actually creating a report gives you an opportunity to continually share those findings and share those results. That also can be shared in a room potentially that you're not in. So your voice can continue to be heard, even though you're not there. So this is a great way to keep that um, topic at the forefront of everybody's minds. And then I know this can be for both in-house and agency, but specifically for agency, create case studies that sell inclusive ways of working. If you're putting this on your website and you're selling these successful projects, hopefully you're going to inspire other organizations to want to do the same or at least have something similar to that. You can obviously do this, like I say, inside an organization with a project. You can create a case study for a project and share that around and hopefully inspire other teams within the organization to do it the same way. All right. Thanks, Bron. Um, so there you have it. Like in summary, we really covered a bunch of topics all in the hope that you can walk away tonight feeling confident to amplify the voice of others and really make the case for inclusion in your company. What we've covered today is why, why you should be caring about inclusion and why it's important for all people. And then how, how can you spread that knowledge and influence your teams to care? And lastly, what Bron just touched on is reminding your teams of the success by making sure it's measurable. So we're just gonna end on saying you have the confidence ahead of it like we need to remind ourselves and you know in the push and pull of working with different stakeholders and different processes you're doing a great job even by just all you're coming to this meetup and having these discussions I'm loving the questions that are in the chat that's just a great first step so lastly I'm just going to touch on all the great things that you're doing you're amplifying the voice of others you're making sure that no one's left behind you're bringing people together. And lastly, that all just leads to creating a world that's better for everyone. So thank you all for joining. I'm really interested in Q&A with Bron. We've got some resources here that we'll share out after, but I'd love to also just know what you're doing within um, inclusive design in your company. Awesome. Thank you so very much, Bron and Vanessa. I'm going to share my screen now so big clap over you there um that was so <laughs> awesome um i was so busy taking notes i was like oh my gosh it's ending um that was great because um not only was that uh, so structured but it gave you both gave such tangible actions including like what to say which i know sounds a little bit silly but when people say talk to your you know pms about it sometimes it's it's hard to phrase it in a way that they'll get it. So thanks for the tips. Um, before we jump into Q&A, one thing I wanted to say to the community, online virtual meetups, they're not the same as in-person meetups. If we were all together, um, it'd be easy to you know, network and know you're interested in, uh, in inclusive design, let's connect. And I know it's a lot different um, online, but a suggestion, 
Um, we will be putting this um, recording up on our Ladies at UX Melbourne YouTube channel. So if you just Google, um, not Google, if you go into YouTube and type Ladies at UX Melbourne, you should find the channel. Share it on LinkedIn, write about it and, you know, tag us. And um, if you see anyone tonight that also mentioned that they attended, write to them. Hey, you attended it too. Are you interested? And that's probably a good way to build your allies outside the organization because um, I, I respect it's very hard uh, to do it online, but just going to give an idea there. So um, networking. Love community. it, Berlin. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Amazing. Well, questions. Um, I've got Eva, who is also with me uh, from Ladies at UX Melbourne, helping me out with questions. For anyone that joined us in the last uh, hour, we're doing it on Slido. So please go to Slido, um, sli.do, and key in the code 650607 and pop in a question. Until then, I'll pass it over to Eva. Thanks, Berlin. And yeah, big round of applause for our speakers today because that was um, just an amazing presentation. I'm still reeling from all the information and um, can't wait to check out all those resources. Cool. So um, I'm going to jump to the slide of questions. So make sure you vote as well so we can get through as much of these as possible. We still have got lots of time to get through, so it's looking good. But I'll just jump straight into the first one. Um, who are the most critical stakeholders to have the inclusivity conversation with? Great question. Good answer. Do you want to take it or shall I? I'll, I'll start and you can definitely, I'm sure you've got some great opinions too. So who are the most important stakeholders to drive this change? I think it starts, there's a few different ones. I believe in your relationship with your product manager is so important. So when I was talking about trust earlier, at the end of the day, like you and your PM should be a, like that mini equal partnership. So I would actually say that is such a, such an important stakeholder. Definitely your design team, they'll be spreading inclusion in other areas. But if you wanna find immediate change in action, that partnership with your product manager is so important and they can help drive, for example, like the OKRs with leadership as well. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, I mean, maybe even your design manager, if you've got a design manager who can take it up to potentially sort of GM level or director level and talk about it a little bit further for you. Um, if you are at that level, hopefully you can be the one that takes it to them and inspiring your team as well. Like you want allies in your designers, you might be a manager and you've got to literally inspire. I'm not proud of this word, but the doers, the ones that are on the tools every single day implementing these changes. So um, I'd say them as well. Awesome, great. Uh, the next question is, how do you know all the physical and cultural limitations to include for, is there a guide? And I think you've touched on a few of these before. Yeah, yeah, so there's a few different ones. I mean, WCAG is obviously a great starting point. Um, your universal score actually talks to a lot of the um, levels, or the, not levels, sorry, the, um, uh, I don't want to just say disabilities, disabilities and neurodiversities to be aware of. Um, this question was specifically around which ones to design for, correct, Eva? Well, it's, it's around um, the physical and cultural limitations, um, like a guide to, I guess, like being inclusive of those nuances. And I guess cultural one, that was an interesting one, I think, too. Yeah. Yeah, cultural one's a really interesting one. Um, for me, cultural is about sort of self-education and making sure that you actually have that diverse team because they're going to be the ones that you... I'm trying to work out how to word this correctly. I don't know, Vanessa, if you've got a better answer than me. <laughs> I think understanding... Are we, are we talking about culture, understanding cultural differences and gaining empathy there? Yeah, well, the question is worded as like physical and cultural limitations. So I'm thinking um, my mind went, went straight to doing research with the specific people that you're designing for. Um, but yeah, if you have anything to add to that, Vanessa. I think it's also um, language. Culture comes so much with like language limitations as well. And for example, I'm just going to go straight to my um, problem case. So we design restaurants, for, we design software for restaurants. 
and the owners of our restaurants are not technically obviously savvy but as we know food there's so much diverse cultures and a lot of different cuisines so you will be dealing with a lot of different peoples and their um you know that comes in the way that they like respect different people walking into a restaurant how they welcome people in so I think culture is absolutely embedded in a lot of different areas. Um, one thing I would add to that um, is there is some resources that maybe I can share around etiquette and language. Um, and so it's a lot around like how you could conduct your user testing um, and how you should be kind of the language that potentially you might want to use. Um, I, have an example of, I think when I first did user testing with um, someone who had a disability, I asked them how it impacted their life. Um, and they basically wanted to, they came up to me at the end and said, oh, it doesn't impact my life. I don't live with it. It is part of me. So they educated me on the language that I should be using, um, which I found was amazing, but obviously not all people are comfortable with doing that. So yeah, these resources help with a little bit of that. Yeah, amazing, thank you. And I can see that Alison and Beatrice have also put in a few links in the chat. So yeah, thanks for that. Awesome. Um, cool, next question is um, specifically for Benaz. Did you see any difference between San Francisco compared to Australia in this space? Interesting. Um, around it, I would say not really, and that's what I think is a great thing that we are all as a design community globally do see this as a factor. I know that I've attended a few talks and meetups. I've got one person on my team, Trace, I'm also shouting him out. He'll see this when he wakes up. He speaks a lot about this as well. So I think the great thing that I'm seeing is as a whole, a lot of designers are wanting to speak about this. And I think that's great. Awesome. I can give you other differences around the two different things on different topics, but this is a great one that I'm seeing equal. Yeah, I think that's a whole other um, conversation or even <laughs> event. <laughs> um, next question is, how might we make the case for inclusive design in an agile environment where teams may be more inclined to create and launch an MVP? I actually talked about this with my manager the other day, and I'm really trying to remember what he said. <laughs> um, That's a great question. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, I talk about leaning on exactly the same tools that you would be doing anyway. It's, it kind of goes back to that kind of last bit where I talked about measurements and using validation and testing. We should be doing everything the same way that we were before and the same way that the agile process works but just making sure that we expand our user base um, or our research um, as such so for me it really shouldn't be um, too much of a, a, a difference yeah yeah, and I'll just add it's all, I, I believe, like making sure things scale. So you don't need to go straight out with, uh, as we said, with one of the things, like all the lists that we did of the different examples, we want it to be like this big innovative product, but we just need to make sure that it scales and gets to that point. So it's the balance between vision, but also like being realistic. But that question also leads into that first um, slide when it was like you may hear around inclusive design takes up a lot of time and where's the ROI this is another one that you're going to get that when you're working with sprints yeah great um and yeah Alison that great comment as well about um having it like do an audit every sprint I think the other thing I can add to that is yeah it's a part of like your checklist of like delivery so you know you have code reviews you have QA like the testing like it's just a part of like there's not too much more to add to that I think and that's what um that was what I was taking away from from the discussion before cool uh next question when approaching user research what are some ways I can improve or better uncover inclusive insights you can take this off on I'll follow okay. up with yeah, yeah. Um, 
So I think that kind of goes back to personas. If you're using personas, making sure that you're using a diverse uh, group of people in your personas. I think too often we go for the kind of the cliche user or the power user um, and miss out on a lot of requirements and a lot of insights from them. Uh, bringing them into the room early. Uh, if you're doing a design sprint or an ideation session, if you can bring in some of your users or speak to your users, then um, that's also a great way. I think the other thing to lean on in if you are running a workshop is making sure that you run an inclusive work, um, inclusive, yeah, inclusive process for your workshop. So a lot of the time there's the power dynamic of the fact that I think and as you kind of talked about it earlier, which is, or I know Berlin, sorry, that designers feel like or are presented in the center of the world. Like, you know, we're the designers, we know it all, we're the experts. And so when you bring in lots of different people and lots of diverse users, often you almost create yourself in a stance of power um, and put yourself in a position of power. So there's an element that you need to work with and almost to change that. It's, it's, there's a whole load of different tools you can do, but different listening or ways to go about it or create rules of engagement and things like that. So um, inclusive workshops is a huge one where you can get lots of diverse opinions if you kind of switch the power dynamics. That was a really waffly answer, I apologize. <laughs> yeah. and. If you can start internally, then it could be easier for you to do research externally. So we also do research internally in our company. If you're working with B2B tools, I know it's, it's, it, it is harder to conduct research or just more challenging. So again, reminding you, this is all about creating that diverse set of teams. When you're making sure you're, I'm testing a product, I'm going to be testing that product to someone in sales or someone in support to get that, again, encourage that diverse set of opinions. Might also quickly jump in because that question is so awesome. Um, because I think um, the ADP list, which Benaz and Bron are a part of, had a had a another meetup that covered this. And when you think about your users, we're currently going through a very difficult time uh, in history with this pandemic. Have you considered in your personas as well how the pandemic has impacted them in your problem space? especially with mental health and anxiety being so um, topical. I don't know how many companies have embedded that part, that lens, um, and how you intend to move forward with your product, knowing that uh, the pandemic will have lasting effects. So I thought that was also another thing to keep in mind. It's quite easy as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. We created a whole different set of, because we're, our, our users are restaurants. Um, so we actually have pre-COVID now and post-COVID during COVID, post-COVID personas, we absolutely had to do it last year. And that's something we still reference those points. Yeah, great question and great answers as well. Um, next question is, could you share ways you have creatively built organizational awareness and understanding of inclusive design if the organization is just starting its journey? Yeah, I might start with this. So one thing that I, I'm not sure what part of the organization starting its journey. Does that mean it's like a startup or journey in inclusive design? I'm going to take it. Yeah, the, it's not specific. I think it's okay. just if it's an organization that's starting or if the person that asked the question wanted to clarify. <laughs> no, all good. I'll run with it. So I actually did run a very similar workshop, the, the workshop you did with inclusive score because my large design team We've been all thinking about it in different levels, but to level set on the workshop was important. So running that workshop, but then how can you then take away those actions? So then I synthesized all the information of each one of those designers scores. And now what I'm planning on doing is it's one of my tasks literally this week is to work with my manager because she's again got that higher voice in me and create that as an OKR. And then she will work with the VP of product to drive that as an organization OKR. So it's again, all about like, like I have to work with my manager and she's going to trickle that up higher as well. I don't really have anything to add to that one. <laughs> what was that? I don't really have anything to add to that one. Yeah. I said that through wonderfully. <laughs> awesome. 
cool. Um, next question is, if a team has limited resources and time, how would you recommend in prioritizing the type of inclusion to include or research into the project? Um, I could take that. I think that goes back to that goals piece. Um, as a team or a project, like, have you got a set of goals for this project? Or even as a, a pod, maybe, or a, a design pod, you have a set of goals. Um, lean on them, lean on existing material. Basically, anything that doesn't require a re-education of or um, a kind of to convince them to do or add on um, is going to be beneficial. So if you have a goal about, you know, meeting or increasing, I'm trying to think what might be a good goal, what do we have at the moment, but uh, something around meeting the needs of the users or something, you can make sure and say 15% of the users have to be, um, or d define who you want your users to be, or if yours is about getting user testing, you need to make sure that um, if you're testing with 12 participants, four of them have to experience some sort of disability of, of some kind, so you know, test with disabilities. Um, so lean on basically existing goals if you can. Um, if you can get new ones in, even better, but um, a lot of the time, yeah. Yeah, I, I'd, all I'll say adding to that, and it's just all about like, you can, we can prioritize what we want to do, but remember, we don't need to feel like we're doing everything at once, just keep starting small. So as Bron said, start something small that's achievable that exists today. Yeah, amazing. Um, the next question is an interesting one. Who's doing this well? Any role models? Oh, good one. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, yes, Airbnb, yeah. doing a great job. Um, Apart from uh, yourselves, of course. <laughs> yeah, it was <laughs> um, Microsoft are doing awesome yeah. at this. Um, Microsoft had Cat Holmes um, come from them, and she's the one that writes on mismatch and in inclusive design. Uh, IBM um, and like Carbon are doing huge things for them as well. Um, but as of you want any others that you've come to mind? I was going to say Airbnb and Microsoft, so you've covered my ones. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to think of this and others. I mean, there's a lot of the larger um, sort of SaaS ones are, are really working hard to, um, yeah, think about uh, inclusive design. I've just seen B yeah. actually, by the way, put on Amazon Alexa. Mm -hmm. um, if you haven't, Alexa is obviously female. Um, this is just a side note, Soz. Um, <laughs> there is a, um, which I don't, I don't love. Siri can be male or female, but often it's like um, one of those things of like, oh, really? There is a voiceover, if you haven't heard of it, called Q. Um, and it's the first non-gendered voiceover. Uh, it's awesome. The work that's gone into kind of creating this non-gendered voiceover is amazing. Um, so Q is the name if you wanted to look at it side note <laughs> awesome how do you spell that fun it's literally i think it's just q oh it's just q. q okay <laughs> q yeah i think it is i'll have to double check and then i'll i'll add it to our list but um yeah it's it's amazing so it's amazing what they can do if they choose to do it yeah great and if anyone has any more suggestions feel free to pop them in the chat as well thanks for the question Luke. um next one is as someone who is transitioning to the UX field, how important is it to incorporate accessibility into our journey and portfolio building? I think it's quite important. The fact that you can prove that and present that in your, if you're transitioning, I'm, I'm imagining you're building out your portfolio and interviewing possibly, but sometimes we never, you know, it's always embedded, but if you can outright say that, I really thought about inclusivity or accessibility. For me, if I was hiring, I would actually find that would really stand out a lot. So I think that's quite important and something I haven't actually seen that often when I look at portfolios. Yeah, just second that entirely. I mean, when trying to meet the needs of users and, and ultimately would love to um, 
So again, that kind of, we want to see what you're going to be implementing in your approach to real life projects. And so implementing it into your portfolio would be amazing. Yeah, awesome. And I think, you know, the good thing about portfolios is that you can always add that lens onto it. If the project you did, you know, you didn't get a chance to do that, um, you can always come back and say how you would have done that if you had the time and resource to do that. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, next question is, do you normally complete a universal score as a team or individually? There may be a bias if completed individually. I've, to be honest, never implemented it in my team. Um, we've never done it in our team because we obviously do design system slightly. Not that that's a reason not to do it, but yeah, we've never done it in our team. So I've done it only by myself, <laughs> which you're right, um, is a bias. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was interesting. So when I did that workshop with the design team, it was all in one, everyone, it was, we did it in Fig Jam and it was all, I could see everyone's scores and everyone did their own products, but we always do a lot of workshops with our designers, but it's also so important to translate those workshops with your actual squads, because those designers are all like in our, in our company embedded within the squad so that question is really inspiring I'm going to probably start encouraging the designers to be running that same exercise within their within their engine product teams yeah it sounds like a great um like kickoff activity you know at the start of a project or things like that yeah. mm -hmm. awesome um next one's not really a question but thanks Bonnie who's joining us from Texas it's three well it was through 42 a.m when she posted um, yeah, we really appreciate you joining us in the middle of the night. So um, shout out to Bonnie. Um, the next question is, what, um, is the definition, what are your definitions of the difference between accessibility and exclusive design? Um, yeah, so I kind of touched on this earlier, which is inclusive design is kind of a holistic method that you can apply to your design practice. Um, you can implement everything from kind of all the way early up of kind of discovery and thinking about inclusion. You can also do obviously an accessibility audit, but um, thinking about your testing, you're doing your personas, you're then doing your um, prototypes, et cetera. And accessibility for me is more an outcome of inclusive design. It's, I don't want to say at the end, but you think about them kind of inclusive design, and accessibility is, if, like I say, done well, is part of your inclusive design process. I hope that answers it. Do you have anything to add to that, Nat? No, I was like, I, I just soak in whatever Bron says, so I love it. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Um, I'll keep going. So um, are there any changes you would make to research methods for formative inclusive research? Can, sorry, Eva, can you, uh, uh, can you ask that question again? I missed that. Oh yeah, no, that's okay. So the question is, are there any changes that you would make to research methods for formative inclusive research? Oh, I've struggled to put that together, so. I th yeah, I think change like any methods that we do today that could be adjusted um, to be more inclusive. So if I try to think of the methods that we're doing, I mean, recruitment's definitely one. That's the top of the funnel. So obviously that, that's what Bronwyn really touched on earlier when we were talking about research. Um, we need to be careful when we're doing a lot of the research, like obviously in the remote world, we're doing a lot of research digitally. Um, but we can't be, you know, like there's all these like card sorting exercises or things that we do with a physical, um, physical space. So everyone kind of deal, like you have to deal with like different like abilities as well. So it's just when you're recruiting customers, just being really conscious of, um, everyone's abilities and then adjusting from there. But I can think of very specific things right now. Yeah, I think um, maybe the, the question is really, I guess, maybe specifically for like generative research. I, um, that's how I'm interpreting it. Like, so, at, you know, at the start and maybe not so much the usability testing, but I think what you've said applies to, to that anyway, um, especially with the recruitment part, I think. Um, 
if I've understood it correctly, and I'm sorry, because I struggle to take questions in immediately without spending time registering them a little bit. Um, the other thing is that we can actually lean on a lot of existing ones um, that are focused on um, inclusivity. So one of the greatest um, methods out there is obviously the contextual research. Hard to do at the moment, but if you can actually go and meet the participant in their space and um, just observe rather than kind of again it kind of always comes down to the power if that if you bring them to your space and you're the one setting up the questions and you're the one um kind of getting them to work on an unfamiliar laptop or computer that can be really hard and really just non-informative because it's completely different for them it's nothing that they would really experience whereas if you actually go and observe or go to their space you might actually see things and experience the participants or the users or the um in their like real real life and i think that's what's really important you might see that the fact is, is the mum actually has a baby in one arm while trying to cook dinner and it has the laptop behind her and is trying to answer an email a lot of that you would miss from obviously bringing them into your space and that's just a well-known method inside the industry. Another thing to also consider, which is quite small, um, is we tend to do research um, during our office hours, which kind of makes sense. But if you think about it, what if you wanted to talk to someone who doesn't have that luxury to come spend an hour with this during nine to five when they have you know, a certain job where they can't get out. So I thought that was an interesting thought of a colleague of mine um, uh, suggested to me to consider. Of course, this will be something you need to consider your team, but I did think, oh, wow, we only had certain blocks during the working days. Not everyone can make those times. And if you also have morning blocks, parents doesn't can't often make those times. And so what are you missing out by um, conducting research at a point that is convenient to you. Um, I think it's a thought exercise, it's worth considering. It's not a must, but it's just worth considering. Yeah, great Absolutely. point, Berlin. Um, thanks for adding that. And what um, I was started thinking about as well was, um, you know, just the tech literacy as well. Like when you're doing research with people, especially now when a lot of it is online and remote, um, I've just had so many sessions where, you know, like, phones stopped working, desktop didn't working, like the tools mm -hmm. just stopped working. And it's just, I guess that's an exclusive act in itself, but you know, um, something a challenge that we still have to keep working through, I guess. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, one last one um, worth thinking about as well is when you are beginning to think about who you're um, actually testing with or even speaking to, is whether you're the right person to be asking the questions or speaking with them. A lot of the time, um, not a lot of the time, sometimes it actually might make the person very uncomfortable. So I'll give an example of we did a um, project with youth homelessness when I was back in an agency and I was, they were scared and they didn't really want to talk to anyone that was deemed authoritative. And so actually they spoke to their social workers and they were, the social workers were the one testing and talking to them and were much more on the level. There was that trust there that meant that we could get much more um, deep informative information than if I'd, for instance, I'd come in and started questioning or my colleague had come in and was sitting there. So we actually, um, again, just thinking about the scenarios and, and trying to empathize with the full situation is probably mm. a good one. Yeah, I like that. That's such an important point. Yeah, great point. Um, I'm going to try and get through the rest of these questions because we've got five more minutes, but, you know, loving the, all the questions that have come through, it's been really good to go through this. Um, could you share any experiences or recommendations for recruiting research participants with inclusivity in mind? Um. So there's, there's a very literal way, which is there is user, uh, sort of, what I'm trying to think, user testing platforms that focus on accessibility and inclusivity, more accessibility than inclusivity. So an organization, I think it's called Fable, um, they're Canadian, um, actually 
specializes in accessibility user testing. So you can do something like that. Um, in the Australia, there is Intopia, and I feel like I just saw Ben say Vision Australia. I know that they help potentially with um, recruiting participants. Ben, you might have to correct me on that if I've got that wrong. I know Intopia do. Um, so again, getting support from external connections and teams. I mean, uh, it is sometimes incredibly difficult to build up your own um, connections initially, but once you start, you can kind of build on top of that and you can build some trust. Um, again, with inclusion, it does really stem from building an inclusive team. If you're building an internal inclusive team, you're naturally going to have networks that are far beyond what you experience. So, um, yeah, it's, it can be a long process if you're doing it on your own accord, but there are some smaller quick wins. Excellent. Um, that next, the next question we have is um, similar. So it's around recruiting as well. So I think I'm going to skip that one. Um, next question from Luke is thoughts about using a person that's actually impacted by accessibility um, as if any company doesn't have many of these. Sorry, if you um, need to clarify that question, Luke, if you want to come with me. It was more about using um, people that work for the company as heroes and champions to actually show um, people that make decisions how badly like a stupid, you know, web page design or a product design can actually impact their life. Yeah, totally. That goes back to finding allies from a diverse set of people and then testing internally. And I love that point. What's the impact? What's the impact of being inclusive? I think also like justifying, showing the emotion. And if you could bring, you know, if it's an internal person, you can, you have the luxury then to bring them into meetings, possibly during your nine to five. And they can then share that, um, really share their feelings. So I love that. Like really, really what's the impact of showing inclusive inclusion? I shared a link. I, I, oh. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to say, um, I shared a link in the chat. Oh, you go, Bronwyn. That was really no, good. no, no, no. You finish off and then I'll say my bit. <laughs> I was just going to say, I shared a link in the chat about inclusive product design. Um, and I heard a lady with cerebral palsy, I think, on the news. And it, made, it literally made me bawl my eyes out. And she was talking about how hard it was to dress her children in the morning because of buttons and other, you know, really badly designed things and literally she replaced everything with velcro and it changed their life um so that was the reason I, I mentioned that thing before yeah awesome awesome i would say one thing to be careful of is um not i like putting them on a pedestal or idolizing them and allowing them to come to you you might put it out on a channel or on a slack message or an email and make sure that they come to you and meet with you and agree that they are comfortable with that. Um, you might be familiar with the term of, um, oh God, I've forgotten. If literally I had it on my mouth, in my tongue, then I completely forgot. Um, something inspiration. Um, oh, it's just gone, but it's basically about how we do see a lot of these, I think it's like inspiration porn. Yes, thank you. <laughs> inspiration porn literally words out of my mouth Alison you're reading my head um we spend time you know looking at these stories and seeing these stories and thinking oh that's so wonderful that you know it's so great but this is their everyday life and it shouldn't be potentially put in front of able body it's very much around ableism and, and things like that it shouldn't be put in front of people and we should be kind of going oh that's great well done them they've done an awesome job and yeah, it can be quite demeaning. So um, just being mindful of that if we are going to use people inside the company. Yeah, I love Alison's comment about, um, you know, that's asking disabled people to take on extra work. If they want to, that's fine, but don't put the onus on them. Um, so great summary of that. Um, and I think we're just going to, sorry, we're just hitting 7.30. So I'm going to finish off with the last question. And it's actually quite a nice one to end with. What has been your biggest wins in championing inclusive design in your organizations? Ooh, um, 
My, I'm going to say mine one before going to coming to zero. Not that zero don't do it, but um, when I was I was in a much smaller company, there was only about 21 of us, and um, I managed to implement an accessibility program of work, um, and it went from being a do this in your part time if you've got any downtime, but you're not having any budget, you're not having any additional time for it to basically being one of the organization's um, key kind of, well, one of their, their selling points um, and how we actually implement, made sure to implement accessible designs kind of to meet AA standards and if necessary, AAA, um, which was awesome. Um, I'm gonna say my win is something that's happening right now. So we've all, as I think I said before, our team has always been thinking about inclusive design, but I think inclusion and other aspects when we're designing for enterprise, some aspects just get a little bit like pushed to the side, for example, even like visual design or design, like delightful design. But my team now is becoming like a little bit more mature and we're thinking about like leveling up. So by running that workshop, I'm seeing, I think my win is just a cultural win. People are having those discussions like on Slack and that workshop really helped them, you know, like start those discussions with, the, with their PMs. Like I think I showed you Grayson on my team that her seeing her design, to be honest, that was such a big win for me. And that's why I put it in this presentation. Um, and then on top of that, my manager believing in the workshop. So we're going to be aiming to put that as an OKR. So I'll keep you all updated, but it's just cultural changes I'm noticing. Awesome. Thank you so very much, Ness and Ron. Um, I can't believe I have to say, definitely within the last year at Ladies at UX, we've never gone through a 35 to 40 minute Q&A session. So thank you everybody for submitting so many amazing questions to keep the conversation going. Um, I hope you got a lot out of tonight's um, event. Uh, thank you, especially to Bonnie. Now we know you're dialing in at about 3, 4 a.m. in Texas. So thank you so much for joining us as well. As we mentioned, uh, the recording will be posted on our uh, Ladies at UX um, Melbourne YouTube channel. Um, and if you haven't already signed up to meet up, um, our meetup uh, group, because we will post our next event there as well. Um, thank you again to everyone. Thank you again to Vanes and Bron. It was amazing and have a great evening, everyone, or morning, wherever you are.